Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Allred, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of, our, of the presentation. Our next webinar is on May 26th um, with Jacqueline Kanyuk um, about getting individualized help through family search. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on finding your ancestors in Spain. James has over 39 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He has served as a family history volunteer for 17 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Um, and James, if you are ready, we will turn the time over to you. Okay. Well, we'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today. Uh, remind everyone that these webinars are recorded and they're available on the Brigham Young University YouTube channel. We have over 500 webinars on and uh, instructional videos on our channel and uh, new ones are being done and paid up and made uh, uploaded every day. So they should be there ready to listen to. Um, we'd like one of the things that we're that I've been trying to do is to uh, cover a lot of the countries of Europe and the records, uh, kind of the basic record sets of each of the countries of Europe. Uh, it's interesting. People should uh, uh, in the United States uh, probably do not realize that Spanish is the second most used language in the world. And there are actually more people who use Spanish than any other language except Chinese. So it's sort of the kind of uh, the thing where there's lots of people out there that are doing uh, research. And I've been helping people in the uh, from the Family History Library in uh, Salt Lake City and in BYU uh, with research from Latin America, Spanish speaking people from Latin America. So that's been quite an experience. And this is a an interesting topic to cover. Um, first of all, we have to understand that Spanish history dates back to prehistoric times. Uh, it is part of Europe and it is very, very, um, uh, been populated for thousands of years. Some of the earliest uh, artifacts of uh, our human civilization have been found in the Iberian Peninsula, which is uh, where Spain and Portugal uh, and are located. One of the big important things about learning about genealogy is to understand that uh, genealogy is history. It's a specialized part of history, but understanding the greater uh, historical things that occurred in the country where you're doing research is uh, indispensable for having a, a very good uh, understanding of how to do how to find people and and how to place them in the time and the place where they lived. So, what we do is try to to encourage. I try to encourage people to to understand a little bit more about the history than just uh, the fact that they, they, their ancestors came from Europe or from a place called Germany or a place called Italy or a place called Spain, because that does not necessarily reflect their particular uh, cultural background. 
uh, one of the most important things about uh, Spanish history is that it has uh, the Spanish culture uses elements or has in, in its absorbed elements from a, a variety of different cultural backgrounds. And one of the most influential was the Roman occupation of, of Spain, which happened uh, from uh, early in the 300s into about the early in the 300 BC to about the same time after almost a thousand years of occupation. Part of the fact that the, the vacuum that occurred when the uh, Roman Empire began to implode and uh, began to be uh, invaded by the Germanic tribes and also from, um, from other parts of the world, uh, Spain in particular, the Iberian Peninsula is that big long piece that sticks out of Europe that is where Spain is. And the uh, important thing that happened there in 711 was that the, the Moors began invading Spain. The Moors were, cons were partially people who, in, who lived in Northern Africa, but they were also a uh, background of Arabs. So there was an Arabic culture that, uh, that came in and uh, invaded beginning in 711. By 750, all of the Spanish nation that we have today was, and Portugal was uh, occupied by the, the Moorish king uh, emperors. Uh, they were um, basically speaking Arabic languages. In beginning in uh, later in the, in the years, Isabel and, Fernand, and Fernadant, Ferdinand were made king and queen, then they united two parts of, uh, of Spain, the kingdom of Castile and, uh, and the kingdom of uh, Aragon. And when those two uh, kingdoms merged because of the marriage, uh, that they became uh, the predominant ruling group in the country. The whole part of the southern part of, of Spain was still occupied by, by the Moors or the Arabs, uh, and except for the Kingdom of Portugal, which had been, which was a separate country. And in any kind of uh, study of genealogy, there are four main categories and of challenges. First of all, you've got to deal with the language. Now, if you're dealing with English, you'd think, oh, well, you know, I know the language, that's not going to be a big deal. Well, the answer is that uh, only works. But as you go further back in time in, in English, you'll find out that the language changes considerably. And if you go far enough back in English, you'll go into the fact that it goes into Middle English, and it may even go back into Old English, in which neither of those are, are, would be understandable languages to someone today. So you wouldn't be able to understand someone speaking Middle English or Old English. And there are also varieties of English around the world. In addition to the language challenges of uh, foreign languages, particularly if your ancestors came from uh, a country that was a non-English speaking country, you have to deal with handwriting. And uh, handwriting is another part of the history that has changed considerably over time. And once again, the further back in time you go, uh, looking for language, looking for uh, records, you'll find that the handwriting is one of the biggest challenges. And also, there's the challenge of the availability of the records themselves. They may or may not be available. You may have uh, situations where uh, the record sets have not yet been digitized. They're not online. And the only place they exist is in the uh, location where they were created and stored. And that may not be convenient because they, in this case of Spain, you may actually have to go to the, to the archives or to the, uh, the church buildings or church archives in, in Spain to find the records. And the lastly, the condition, as you can see from this example on the screen, uh, records have a tendency to be made out of, out of perishable materials, and those perishable materials do perish. 
So you might lose parts of your of your uh, records if you're uh, not uh, if they aren't haven't been carefully uh, taken care of, which happens quite frequently, by the way. So given those uh, particular challenges in Spain, of course, it helps considerably to speak Spanish or some form of Spanish. And it also, if you don't speak Spanish, learn to use Google Translate. Now, Google Translate is a program that's free from Google. It's translate.com.google.com. And it is, um, it will take all of almost 100 languages and translate them in between all the different languages. So you can take anything in Spanish and put it in, copy and paste it or type it in, and it will translate it into English. Uh, there's always a question about how good the translation is. Uh, what you can say from using, what I can say very, very firmly from using Google Translate for genealogical purposes is that the translations are very adequate and very helpful. And it's, a, it's an extremely useful tool. And I use it frequently, even though I'm doing Spanish, uh, I, I read, write, and speak Spanish. I still use Google Translate because there's many times that the records, the words are not familiar to me and I need to have that uh, extra help. Now, historically in the genealogical community, there were Spanish genealogical word lists and they had word lists created primarily by the predecessors of Family Search. Uh, these particular word lists are, have been incorporated into the Family Search uh, Research Wiki, which is on the familysearch.org website. Go to the search tab, which is at the top of the page, and then you'll be able to uh, find the wiki and just put in the country that you're looking for. And when you get to that, you'll be able to search further for word lists and follow all of the um, available resources that there are for almost every country of the world. Uh, for, on the uh, research wiki. It's a very valuable resource. Now, an important thing, another important thing about the language in, in Spain is to realize that the language is not uniform. Uh, it's obvious, this map, by the way, does not have Portugal and Portuguese is considerably different than Spanish. Uh, someone who speaks Spanish well and someone who speaks Portuguese well can kind of get along. They can almost try, they can almost understand each other, but it's it's very 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 challenging. But uh, most of the people who have some uh, sort of casual uh, uh, knowledge about Spain do not understand that there are also a whole lot of other languages spoken there, not just um, Spanish. Now, the Spanish that we have, and if you took Spanish in school, the Spanish with, that you would be studying would be Castilian. And that's that big purple part in the middle. That's the, the main language spoken in the Spanish uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. But you'll see other languages there, Galician, Asturian, Basque, Aragonese, Catalan, Murcian, uh, all of those, uh, Andalusian. Uh, those are all different languages, even though they usually call them dialects, um, I, can, I can assure you that they are not mutually understandable. They're just about as, as different from each other as, as Portuguese. And some of them are as, as, as different as French and Spanish, like Catalan. And Basque, for example, is unique in that Basque is not a Romance language. It's not a language that came from uh, the Roman Empire, as as is are all the Spanish uh, and Spanish dialects and languages, it is unique because it has no traceable ancestry as a language. No one knows where it came from, and it isn't related to any other language in Europe. And so, it's uh, sort of a unique language, and it's uh, very. Uh, if your ancestors happen to come from the Basque country, you may have some uh, interesting times because. There are not as many uh, Basque language uh, helps as there are um, Spanish language helps. 
one of the things and that the tools we have to help us with the uh, deciphering the old handwriting is to uh, look on websites that, that are online. Now, this website, Spanish Paleography Digital Teaching and Learning Tool, is SpanishPaleographyTool.org. And uh, this is a website that takes you through a series of, of lessons and, and uh, illustrations to give you an idea about how to begin to decipher and read the old handwriting. And it's, uh, it's interesting because it's, it's a process of learning. One of the things that ha has happened in our society over the past uh, many years is that uh, schools throughout the United States have, uh, have been kind of decreasing in their emphasis on uh, handwriting, on learning how to do what they call cursive handwriting rather than, than uh, printing in, in uh, printed letters. So many of the young, younger people in our society have never learned how to read cursive and it, that makes it double, di doubly different, difficult to uh, get into some of this old handwriting because they don't even have a basis in English to go, to go from and looking at English handwriting. So I would suggest that if you have, uh, if you're not familiar with with a handwriting uh, system, that you begin by going back in old English records. Uh, you can find any of those on FamilySearch.org, for example, and just go back by years, clear back into the 1500s, and just look at the handwriting and start to uh, try to decipher it, because that will be very helpful in uh, learning enough to decipher the uh, the old Spanish handwriting. Spanish doesn't have to get back very far, just 100 years or so or 200 years before the handwriting becomes um, very different than, than what you would recognize today. There are also, if you wish to go back that far, and by the way, the uh, records in Spain do go back uh, considerably, as I'll, I'll point out in just a few minutes, that uh, there are, are manuscripts all over the, uh, the, the, the world, uh, handwritten documents that go back uh, uh, into antiquity. And uh, once you get back into the really old documents, then you will need some specialized training. And there are websites out there like this Guide to Medieval Mans Manuscript Research that will help you get started into this. Now here's, here's kind of my suggestion. My suggestion is that uh, learning, a, a take, beginning to re do research in a, in a country that does not speak the same language that you started out or your native language uh, is a great challenge. And it, it may take a, a long period of time, even a, a matter of uh, years, uh, if you were to go to classes and, and study uh, intensely, you could probably pick up the, uh, the basics in a, in a shorter period of time. But at most genealogists spend quite a long time before they become proficient in any particular language. My advantage in Spanish was that I had, uh, that I served a, a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Argentina and learned to speak their version of Spanish and then um, I had uh, schooling in Spanish with a degree in Spanish from the University of Utah. And following that, uh, a master's degree in linguistics. Uh, and uh, subsequent to my university training, I spent two years as an army officer uh, serving in the uh, Republic of Panama in, in, uh, in, the Central, in Central America. So I had a considerable exposure to Spanish uh, for many years. And then when I started to do Spanish research, I realized that there was still a tremendous amount of, of things that I needed to learn, all the vocabulary and also how to read the handwriting and all of the other things that go along. But that's something that's been acquired over a, over a relatively long period of time. So don't get discouraged. Uh, it is doable, it's possible, and you should, uh, uh, not discount the fact that uh, uh, there are some fabulous opportunities for doing research once you get into Spanish records. There's another really good help for learning how to read some of the old languages, and this is uh, throughout Europe. You'll see here on the, on the slide that uh, 
you can, uh, that there are tutorials here for uh, Old English, uh, German, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, Swedish, Latin, French, and Italian. Um, Latin's helpful, uh, particularly if you're looking at church records in any of the European countries, because if you go far enough back into the 18, 1700s and before, you will undoubtedly run into church records written uh, partially or completely in Latin. So that's also a, a, an interesting thing that you would, you would probably need to know. Now, the, the important thing to understand here is that you don't need to learn to be proficient in the language. You don't have to be able to speak it, uh, but you do need a certain amount of vocabulary to understand uh, the various records that are available in any of the countries, including Spain. But what is the key, the fundamental thing that you need to know to begin genealogical research in Spain? And I would expand this to any, any country in Europe, in the United States or any place in the world. But the answer to this is a precise location. In other words, the only way you're going to be able to determine whether someone you are related to as an ancestor or as a, a relative is really the person you're looking for uh, because of names that are the same and uh, information about an individual that could be very similar or the same. The only way to really separate all these people out is to start by focusing on the places that the events occurred, not on the names, not on the dates. They're helpful. Once you are secure that you have found a specific location, and uh, then you are all ready to go uh, begin looking for the person in the time period that the, ter the person may have lived. But without that location, uh, you're really not going to, you'll find people with the same name and probably approximately or exactly the same dates, but you won't, they won't be the right people and you'll get off on the, on a tangent there. Um, so it very, without even unequivocally, I can say that, that identifying the places is absolutely essential to making any headway. Now, the good thing about Spain is and, and the Spanish culture is that uh, a lot of the records were kept by the Catholic Church. And then we're going to go through some of those records. But I just kind of uh, as uh, tying it into this particular point about the location is that in order to find the, the correct set of records, and you have to know the location when you're in those records, you're going to find that very, very few of your ancestors ever moved. And so you will find hundreds, if not thousands of people within every parish going back hundreds of years uh, using Sp Latin American and Spanish research. This is just, it just opens up a world of names of people and uh, you can just keep going back generation after generation. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes the records have a break and that may stop that a particular line. But as you go back, you remember that the lines increase exponentially. So you have a lot of different choices to, to surnames and people to do research for. So getting started in Spanish research, Spanish language research is, is very extremely productive and very rewarding. Um, important also to understand what are called the jurisdictional, that is uh, areas of the country that were governed by a particular set of laws or a, or a particular administrative uh, agency or an, an entity. And so in Spain, there are three major ci uh, civil divisions. This is not the church, this is the country's government. And they are broken down into municipalities uh, called municipios, and those are, um, you would roughly think of those as being towns, metropolitan areas of a town. Uh, then in each town, all the towns are gathered into provinces, and what you're seeing in this map is are the, are the areas uh, of, of Spain, not the provinces, and not the, um, the, the larger autonomous communities, 
And autonomous communities is a newer term uh, in Spain, but you may find that in the organized in the way that the records that you're looking for are kept. And that basically is one of these kinds of areas uh, that are shown on this map. There's not, these don't exactly correspond. These are the traditional, the ones on this map are the traditional areas and they roughly correspond, uh, correspond to the languages that are spoken in that area. So uh, these are ancient, let's call it not ancient, but traditional uh, jurisdictional uh, areas in Spain. So understanding that the civil records in Spain began in 1871, so you're going to run out of civil records uh, going back even maybe three or four generations, as far as five generations would probably put even the youngest people today back uh, before uh, civil registrations began. And some of the municipios or uh, municipal areas may have registration records going back as early as 1837. So, um, and there will be um, uh, older records that even go back further than that, uh, depending on the place, because I've got a, the copy here in this particular slide is uh, Spanish, is the Spain Madrid Registros Municipales. They're from 1582 to 1900. Um, so there is, there's places where the records go back uh, very, very much, but the general rule is that before 1871, you're not going to find a lot of civil records. Some other things that you need to remember and keep in mind when, when working with not just the records, but because of the history of Spain, that there was a, a huge uh, revolution in Spain. And uh, it, it coincided just previous to World War II. And so they sort of seek, they sort of blend into each other between the, the, the terrible destruction that was done because of the Spanish Civil War and uh, where literally hundreds of thousands of people were killed and into the uh, World War II where many more people were killed, although Spain did not actively uh, participate directly in the war, there was still some, uh, some difficulties and problems in, in Spain. And so you'll also find some other very interesting things about the history as you get into the country. Now, parishes and dioceses. Uh, the Catholic Church is organized into geographic areas called parishes. And these ge geographic areas uh, usually comprise uh, a, a few hundred to uh, a, a couple of thousand people. And they are uh, centered around a church edifice, a building, a church building. And that church building uh, uh, may be a, a very important church building, uh, which we would call a cathedral or it may be just a church, which they would call in Spanish una iglesia. And, uh, but the important thing here is that the parish is uh, represented or uh, directed by a priest in the Catholic church. They have uh, other individuals who participate in the organization of the Catholic church, but it was the duty of the parish priest to keep the records of the church. And this is from very, very uh, old times. And so these parish registers become the, uh, the foundation, basic foundation of doing research in Spain. Oh, back, sorry, diocese. A group of parishes is orga are organized into, uh, the group is organized into uh, a, a diocese. So a diocese, is um, directed by the bishop of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic diocese has uh, a number of parishes, depending on the total population and other political and other factors that they, uh, the diocese has. There is also one more level, but they, that level does generally does not uh, fall into, uh, into the record keeping uh, area, so we don't uh, I guess genealogists did for a tendency to ignore them, but uh, it's not necessarily uh, something you should, you, it's something you should be aware of. And that is there are archdioceses, which means there may be an archdiocese of Spain. 
of the whole country, but there could be several archdioceses in Spain, but because there's no records particularly kept there. Now, what about the diocese? Well, traditionally in the Catholic Church, the bishops would send out a representative, and old times the bishop himself perhaps, would go to each parish and they would copy out a copy of that year's records. So this was a yearly thing that uh, was done, hopefully every year, not always, but it was uh, very regularly done. And these became known as bishops' transcripts. So they were transcripts of the records. So in a sense, there were two sets of records of everyone uh, in Spain. In, uh, in Latin America, there were actually three sets of records because one was retained at the, di at the parish, one was uh, sent to the diocese but was sent to Mexico City, and the third was sent over to Spain and to the, to the head of the Catholic churches in Spain. So there's this great uh, mass of records that has been, uh, been, been created. So the Catholic Church parish registers date from as early as 1307 AD. Now there's almost no place else in Europe where you can go that far back and look at records. Now, let me just say, every, every time you go back another 500 or thousand, between 500 and 850 to 1000 years, you're going to increase uh, measurably the, the difficulty in, uh, in understanding and um, being able to decipher the records and the handwriting. The handwriting gets, gets uh, harder to read and the, uh, the language is pretty much the same. Now, another thing that happens going back in time that you'll still identify rather quickly is that uh, Catholic church records are, are primarily formulaic. That means that uh, if you read a Catholic church record from the 20th century in Spain or in Latin America, and you go back a hundred years, you're going to see that the record form and the content of the record is pretty much the same. And if you go back in time, even 500 or 600 uh, or back to the 1500s or 1400s, <laughs> the same exact information in the same form has been used for, for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years in the, in the Catholic Church. So you're just, uh, it saves you a lot of time because uh, you know exactly what it should say. And so you can find out, uh, then you can just begin to decipher the, uh, the handwriting more easily because you can begin to see the names and uh, the dates and the places and the and the people and the rest of the language, you know, is just uh, the verbiage that fills in the record. You can begin your search for Spanish uh, church records in the Family Search Research Wiki. Once again, I mentioned this. It's uh, in the familysearch.org under the search tab, and it's called the Research Wiki. And there's a, this would be the beginning page for Spain. And down the right-hand side of the page there under the flag, you'll see that there is a list of, of, of different kinds of records. And this is the link to the church records. And there is a very good summary of the records, plus links out to a lot of the records that are on Family Search and a lot of other resources that are on, uh, on across the, the internet. The other thing you should be aware of is that there are uh, family search country and state pages. Uh, these are uh, pages that uh, have been created on the familysearch.org website for many of the countries of the world. When you go to the historical records collection, it's under the search tab for records, then you'll see a map. And if you click on that map, you'll see uh, uh, areas of the world and you'll see countries that are uh, in a list and you select all the countries and they will give you the background. But this will list there's two or three kinds of records. First of all, uh, the records are collected into what is called on family search into what is called the historical record collections. And those are records primarily that have been digitized. These are, they're all digitized records now. There are, uh, 
very, very few microfilm rolls still left that are uh, readily available or used uh, that you would run into. So most all the records that you're going to be able to use are digitized records of the images of the various records or indexes to the records. And so what, uh, what happens here is that you go back, uh, if you go there, you'll find that these are the indexed records. Uh, they've had volunteers go through and index these records. And uh, those, that means they're searchable. So you can put in a name and you can search and find a name. But the important thing to understand about the familysearch.org website is that if you do a name search for your ancestor and you don't find anything, that all that means is you've only searched about anywhere from a third, less than half, between a third and a half of all the records that are on Family Search. So almost two thirds of the records that are available on Family Search are not yet uh, indexed which is a good reason to have a lot of people volunteer doing insect indexing. But these records that are unindexed records are still on the website. And the first place, and then what is listed here is, uh, you can see it down below in the, in the image that's there. It says image only historical records. So there are records. Those records are in the familysearch.org catalog. And that's also under the search tab. So you can go in and, and go into the catalog and find additional records. All of the records in, in all of genealogical research are organized by country, by location, and then by specific locations within the countries and, and other locations within the countries. So you have to drill down through the records and uh, they're not cum they're not uh, duplicative they're cumulative so as you if you were searching records for spain then those records would then you would then see places within spain and then the prov the provincial records would be in addition to the records kept or cataloged as under spain and then if you go down to cities within the within the prov provinces or parishes within the province those would be additional records so there's this kind of hierarchy of, of search that occurs. And this is not just for Spain, it's for all the countries in the world, because that's how they're all organized. And that's the same thing you'll find on every web, every one of the big online websites. Uh, they're just uh, basically organized geographically. Now, there are, um, so there are these three kinds of records, and I'll go back through that. There's first of all the historical records that are the indexed records. So you'll see a place here to, to look for a name. And then you'll uh, go to the unindexed records, and these are the records that are in the catalog. So here you have a listing of the categories of records that are available in Spain. And then above that, you'll see it says places within Spain. And if you clicked on that, you would see all of the provinces listed and you would have more records and uh, under the provinces. The third category of records are called image only collections. And these records are uh, the, the records that are sort of in, uh, in transit. You might want to say these are transit records. Around the world, uh, Family Search has uh, a number of, of people, uh, volunteers, primarily missionaries, church service missionaries, like my wife and I, where we served in the Annapolis, uh, in the uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, in the Maryland State Archives, digitizing records. There are uh, traditionally over 300 of these these missionary couples out uh, digitizing records around the world at any given time. Now, during the pandemic, the uh, number of records being digitized has slowed down because of the lack of uh, being able to cross country boundaries and travel and all that sort of stuff. Some of the archives have been shut down and uh, they're no longer available to be digitized. So we will have a ramping up time uh, after the pandemic uh, when the records are once again being obtained. You'll see there on that list that on this particular page, which is also under the search menu, and it says images, 
And then you once again search for a place and by searching for Spain, what you will see is the records that have been digitized but have not yet been entered into either the catalog or the uh, his historical record collections. And so you won't, and they're not indexed. So your only way of looking through these records is by the place, and you'll see they're all listed by place and in, in a lot of one care, uh, time by diocese. And then these records uh, are all out there. And there are, in this case, there are 415,000 results over that 450,000 results for just one set of records. So there are uh, tremendously large numbers of records out there that are sitting in the online, uh, digitized, fully digitized, available to be searched. But you will need to find those records and then search them page by page. Of course, parish registers are very helpful because they're mainly kept chronologically. So if you have any idea, of course you have to identify the place, but if you have any idea when your ancestor lived, that will definitely focus you on a set of records that uh, you can go through page by page to find uh, uh, the entries of your ancestors. Now, if you find uh, one of your ancestors in the parish register, that's just the beginning. You go one or two years on either side uh, more than recent in time or back in time to find any other of the siblings, any other children born in that family. And then you go back about 18 to 20 years from the time that, that uh, the record is in the, uh, going back as, as far as 18 to 20 years or more, depending on the, the, the particular record that you find to find the, the marriage record for uh, the parents and then uh, just keep going from there. And another thing that's very helpful is that all the women in Spain keep their maiden names. So that's all, they're all recorded. There's no difficulty at all in finding the women's parents. Well, you've got to search and know where and understand the Spanish language and read the handwriting, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it's that there's no definite, there's no, definitely no problem in, in identifying the names of the parents because they are, uh, because the wives keep their, their surnames. So you know what the mother's surname is and you know what the father's surname was. Now the family history guide is a free on, online resource. And what the difference is, is between this and the, and the research wiki is that this is an organization step-by-step step giving you explanations on how to do each of the activities and look for each of the types of records in this particular, in a particular country. And it's available for most of the, the countries of the world that have uh, significant record collections. And uh, there's lots of links and videos and, and helps. And this is a free website uh, and it is uh, supported by donations, and it is also a fam the family search education partner. So it's uh, it's a very a very useful program. It's used to uh, it underlies the the training that we have for our, our uh, church service missionaries at the BYU Family History Library, and also at the Salt Lake Family History Library. Now, this is a copy of the current archdiocese or diocese and then the archdiocese in, in Spain. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is how many different dioceses there are, uh, kind of like a big puzzle of all of the different places in Europe, in uh, Spain, where there are dioceses. And then interestingly enough, there is a, a directory of all the dioceses of Spain. And you can go into actually this directory of Catholic Church has um, diocese directories for the entire world of the Catholic Church online and available and searchable. So you can basically identify the the organist, the church organization any place in the world. And uh, on this map, it's showing you the head where the diocese is located. And then uh, in addition, there are uh, lists of all of the parishes. So in the diocese, uh, uh, 
directories, then they're further broken down into all the different parishes. So there's actually a way of connecting or talking to the parishes where your ancestors lived in Spain. Um, now these are going to contain, the parish registers are going to contain birth, confirmation, marriage, and burial records primarily. There are some other kinds of records uh, of records that are available and some it's not as commonly available, but are available. And one of those is, is a review as a marriage, a pre-marriage review by the diocese, by the bishop. What would happen in Spain is that uh, there were prohibitions be, be, about marrying people who were uh, your cousins of uh, less than three degrees. So if you uh, uh, married a first cousin or a second, tried to marry a first cousin or a second cousin, you would be, uh, you would it would be necessary for you to get a dispensation from the uh, bishop in the diocese. And those, uh, those documents were, uh, are, can be voluminous. They can, in, uh, they can contain affidavits, uh, uh, transcripts of testimony, all sorts of things. Uh, because uh, they had to justify the reason why these, this couple should get married and, and, and assure everybody that there was no, uh, no one was going to object to it. And then in that case, the bishop could uh, issue a, uh, a permission, uh, a dispensation from the Catholic Church allowing the couple to get married. Otherwise, what you're going to get normally in a parish are the birth records which are not really birth records because there are very, very, very few birth records in Latin America. Uh, finding when, the, when a person uh, was born, if, it, if they were born before civil registration, which did record birth, um, is very, uh, it's just chance. You may or may not ever see a birth date. The priest may have written down when the baby was born and maybe not, probably not because that's a record of the, of the, end of, of the baptism of the, of the infant. And then confirmation happened when the, anywhere between the age of 14 up to uh, about 18 years of age. And that was when the, uh, the ch uh, person in Spain or Catholic church person had uh, learned the catechism and, and a sense was, in a sense was confirmed into the church. And then marriage, was another um, recorded that was recorded. Um, the helpful thing about marriages recording in the ca in Catholic Church parish registers is that almost always uniformly, they tell you whether the child was uh, legitimo or natural. Natural was uh, a child born with when the parents were not members of the Catholic Church, had not been baptized. Did not always mean that the child was born out of wedlock, it, it usually meant that the child was born to, to parents who were not officially married in the Catholic Church, but it could be out of wedlock also. They may not have been married at all. Um, and then you also have the uh, hitimo or children who were born whose parents were also married. So that'll tell you whether or not there was a marriage record in the Catholic Church for that couple. That's a kind of a short way to, to get past that problem. And then burial records. Again, there are no death records, not almost a non-existent before uh, civil registration began because the, the burial record was what was kept by the Catholic church. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, parish registers usually contain the maiden names. They almost always do. It's, con it's consistent. And they may, and they may uh, very, very commonly, they, they have the names of the parents of both the, the bride and the groom. So you have uh, the names of the parents of the family almost always listed. And they may uh, usually have uh, one or two or more uh, testigos or witnesses of the marriage. But these people are also the... Um, Generally speaking, they're they're going to be the godparents of the of the of any children that are born. So when a baby's being baptized, it'll name their uh, their godparents, and these are also may also be relatives. They could be 
the grandparents, they could be aunts or uncles or cousins or siblings or whatever, but they're going to be people that came with them and they'll be uh, uh, most of the time related. So understand this, this is the way that genealogy works. The number of surnames double with each new family. So when you go back in time uh, in, in any genealogical research, uh, your, uh, the number of surnames double. Well, in, in Spain, uh, that, that makes it fairly simple because since the wife's surname is always recorded, her maiden name, meaning the unmarried name that she had, uh, and her parents are frequently identified, uh, working backwards in time through Latin American records is, uh, is doable. It's very, uh, it's very doable. Sometimes it gets really complicated because people had very, very similar names all the time. But uh, it, it, it is possible to, to make a lot of headway in Spanish records, given the fact that you have access to uh, a readable copy of the, of the records. Um, so one parish register can produce hundreds, if not thousands of names, because people married their cousins after two, uh, sometimes after two generations, but sometimes even less than two generations. So uh, you, might, uh, you might find all sorts of names back there. And as you keep going, you, you will it become, it'll start to, re, to, you'll start to realize that you're probably related to almost every single person in that parish. So if you do the, the research back in time and then start to do descendancy research from all these people, uh, you may very well find out you fill in almost all the blanks of everybody in that parish. And the parish could be hundreds of, uh, hundreds of years of records, and there could be tens of thousands of people in that, par in that one parish register. If you happen to jump over to an adjoining parish, then you've got another set of thousands of records. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, interesting and uh, although challenging, it is a very productive way and place to do research. So the more you work at it, the more you will find. There's no question that you will find more information the more you work with that. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Um, it looked like we had too many people here today, but I, uh, if there are any questions out there, we'd sure be glad to answer any questions. Okay, well, I'll turn it back over to Anna. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which will be on May 26th. Um, I'm getting individualized help through Family Search with Jacqueline Kenyuk. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at uau.edu or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.